Welcome back to our channel, Our Scientology Stories Peeling the Onion. My name is Mark Fisher, and I'm here with Janice Gillum Grady. Hi, Janice. Hi, Mark, and hi, everybody. Thank you for tuning in. We have some interesting stories for you today. We certainly do. By the way, if you haven't already, please subscribe to our channel. Uh, we really appreciate everybody that's been watching and subscribing. But if you, it really helps us out if you subscribe. Also, hit that like button and uh, also um, a notification. That way you get notified anytime uh, new videos come up. But we really appreciate it. It helps us get this out to more people so that they can see our stories. Okay. All right, Janice. Yeah, so you've, we've got a special uh, show for the, uh, everybody today. Why don't you go ahead and tell them what it's about? Yeah, well, everyone seems to be interested in, one, Commodore's messengers and who they were, and two, people seem to enjoy the photographs we've been posting. So I've put together um, some photographs in a sequence so I can tell the story of the start of the Commodore's messengers, and it only covers the years um, from 1968 until early 71, because after that, we added some more messengers. So this is just going to cover the original four messengers and how it all started. Okay, great. And then for those who don't know, or for our viewers that don't know, who was the Commodore and what, 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 is, what was Commodore? Well, the Commodore was L. Ron Hubbard because we had a fleet of ships. Uh, we had at the time the Royal Scotsman, the Avon River, and the Enchanter. And all of them ended up with name changes where the Royal Scotsman became the Apollo, the Avon River became Athena, and the Enchanter became Diana. And I will cover the ships more in more videos later on. And just, just for this one, I'm just going to cover the original Commodore's messengers. Okay. And then uh, staff and crew on the ship, they referred to him as the Commodore, right? The Commodore said this, or the Commodore wants this. Is that right? Yes, correct. Okay. They didn't go LRH or anything like no, that. No, and they, the like, it's, at St. Hill, he was always called Ron. Right. Everyone come out, oh, hello, Ron, or how's Ron doing? I just heard from Ron. That's how he was referred to. He wasn't referred to as L. Ron. <laughs> he was Ron. And okay, then with the, with the formation of the Sea Org, he was the Commodore. Okay, great. I want to tell the viewers that there are photographs in here that have never really been seen by the public. I've known Janice for over 40 years, and I have never seen a lot of these photographs before, okay? But they're really intimate photos, basically, of life on these on uh, in the Sea Organization in the 60s, the late 60s, early 70s. And I think you're going to be uh, surprised, uh, particularly anybody who's interested in photographs of L. Ron Hubbard. The, there's photos here I've never seen before. So anyway, I think you're in for a treat for at least seeing this part of the history, okay? Okay. All right, let's get started. I'm going to put the first photo up here. Okay, so this was in um, the end of April of uh, 1968. The Royal Scotland was in dry dock in Valencia. And so um, all the young kids were put ashore at a hotel and we had a tutor with us. And so this, this picture on the left with the teeth showing, that's Suzette Hubbard. Next to the her, the white blouse, the white yeah, blouse, and the white blouse yeah. and the plaid yeah. skirt. That's Suzette. Uh huh. And then that's me next to her in the uh, patterned dress. <laughs> and then uh, Claire Popham, she's there with the uh, necklace on in the middle. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the next girl is Polly Lacey. Her aunt was uh, Joan Robertson, the wife of uh, Captain Bill. Okay. And then uh, my sister Terry is on the end. And I, right. don't, I don't remember who that little boy is that's uh, looking down on us. Well, he was photobombing you girls back in yeah, the day. Yeah, he was photobombing us. But I put this in to show in April 68, this is, this is us. Where, how where how this old were you there? I was 11 years old. Wow, and the other girls were about the same age or maybe um, a little older? Suzette, Suzette would have been, she probably just turned 13. Uh -huh. uh, Claire was 12. And um, Terry was uh, 13 as well. Okay. 
All right, great. Yeah. So here's the next photo here. All right, so this is L. Ron Hubbard, the Commodore. And in the background is the Royal Scotman, is the black and white ship, and docked right next to her is the Avon River. And um, we were in Valencia at the time. They just returned from Mission into Time. What year was this? This would have been early 1968. Wow, the, the Avon River is so small in comparison to the Royal Scotman. Right, and I wanted to show that comparison so that when the Commodore was on the Avon River, he could easily get around there. But when he moved over to the Royal Scotman, it was much harder to find people with more decks and a bigger ship. And that's where the Commodore's messengers were created because when he moved to the Royal Scotman, we were selected in order to run messages for him. And wherever he went, we went with him. Okay. And then if he needed someone, we ran off and got them. If he needed something delivered to someone, we went off and did it. Whatever he needed, you know, we were the ones that, you know, ran around the ship to uh, find whatever it was or to relay the message. Okay. So here's the next photo. All right. This was in May 1968 in Marseille, France. Uh, he had been staying ashore in Marseille while the Royal Scotman was sailing around doing what's called the liability cruise. And the liability cruise, I'm going to do a special video on that um, within the next few weeks because I've got photographs from, from that. But we had to finish the liability cruise, then go into dry dock. And then after dry dock, we sailed up to Marseille to pick up the Commodore and have him come aboard. Okay, so, so bri briefly, just briefly explain why there was a liability cruise, just briefly. Well, because the, the crew were very untrained and we had some uh, accidents and um, there's various different things happening that the Commodore felt we were a liability and there could be dangers unless the crew got trained. All right, and then who, who are these people in the photographs here? Now, on the left side with the glasses, that's Al Lipschitz. Um, Al Lipschitz? Anyway, he was in there in 68 and I never saw him again. Okay. Then there's the Commodore holding Mary Sue's hand. That's that's that, his wife, Mary Sue Hubbard. Right, that's, right. that's Mary Sue Hubbard. And then the gentleman, the tall gentleman, that's Leon Steinberg. Okay. Who uh, just recently passed away at uh, 80 plus years old. Mm -hmm. He'd left the Sea Org over 30 years ago, and he was a class 12 originally, one of the original class 12s. All right. And then who's on the right? And on the right is Irene Derman, Irene Dunleavy, or Irene Howie. <laughs> Depending upon who she was married to at the time. Yeah, she was married to Tony Dunleavy at first. And then at this time, she was Irene Howie, married to Bill Howie. And uh, she was the communicator for the Commodore. Okay. And then you cover this liability cruise that we're talking about in book one of your book, right? Commodore's Messenger? Yeah, I do. Yeah. So anyway, any there's a link in our description and on our page that if you want to order the book, on from Amazon, there's book one and book two, but that, um, Janice goes into much more detail if you want to read that the story in those books. All right. All right. So here's the next picture. Okay, this here is see those two red chairs. Those are where the messengers sat, and this is right outside of uh, the Commodore's office, or it was always referred to as the research room, and uh, that's where we sat. And we waited until he needed us and he'd sit at his desk and go messenger and we'd jump up and we'd go running into his into his office yes sir and uh, he would tell us whatever was necessary uh when we did a change of watch or reported for watch um because we stood six hour watches uh -huh. so from six in the morning till noon noon to 6 p.m 6 p.m till midnight and midnight to 6 a.m how many messengers would be on each watch? One messenger at a time in these earlier years. Okay. 
And if you're on the midnight watch and when he secured or went to bed for the night, maybe around three in the morning or four o'clock, uh, we were relieved and able to go to bed ourselves. But later on, we had to end up staying up the whole time. All right. And then here's and, a picture here. Oh. Who's that? Okay. This here is uh, my sister, Terry. And, and this singing. again is where the messengers sat, but this is on the next deck below. Okay. And so when, when the Commodore is sleeping or in, in an Ortin session, we would sit there and you can see um, – Below Terry, there's a sign. You can kind of see Q-U, and it says L-R-H-R-E. And that was quiet, L-R-H researching. So that okay. meant he was he was in doing a solo session, and it was our job to keep everyone quiet. Okay. And then here's the next picture here. What's is that, that you? That, that is me. <laughs> and uh, that when, person, is that, when and where is that? You know, that is up on the flying bridge of the Royal Scotman. Uh -huh. I I learned two different things for bridge watches. One, when I was the director of communications, I learned signals uh, so that I knew I was learning a little Morse code and I knew the flags and what they meant. And this was also lookout training. I was training to be a lookout. And uh, if that shirt that I'm wearing was the messengers are all gotten uh, shirts and they looked like that so that people could tell us apart from everyone else. And if okay, you go to the I'm next picture, how? Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, go. you finish your question. On this no, photo. I was going to ask you, how old were you there? I was, uh, I was 12. Okay. Anything else on that picture? Uh, no. All right. Here's the next one. Okay. You will see that this little boy is wearing the same t-shirt that I was. And because again, that is the uniform messengers wore. Now, in addition to that, we had to wear a sailor hat. And that way people knew that we were on watch representing the Commodore. And this is uh, L. Ron Hubbard, the Commodore, putting the messenger hat on Larry McDonald. Larry's wow. parents were on the ship at the time. His mother was Diane McDonald and uh, father was Jerry McDonald, okay. and his aunt was Sylvia Calhoun. All right, and then um, on L. Ron Hubbard's cap, that's the Sea Org symbol, isn't it, on the front of the cap there? Yes, it is, and there's also that same symbol on the front of the cap that um, Larry is wearing. All right, here we're going to go to the next picture. All right, so here is uh, Ron Pook, or we always called him Pookie, and he's talking to the Commodore, but you'll see the little girl behind him. That's Julie Blundell, and she's wearing the cap, showing that she's on duty. And uh, Julie actually grew up with me in Australia. Uh, she's about a year or two younger than me, and uh, but she was a messenger with me. And yeah, wherever the Commodore went, we followed him until he needed us to go run and get someone or whatever. Okay, now how, how old was she there? Julie was probably 10 at the time. Okay, and her parents were on the ship with her, right? Yes, her parents were on the ship with her. Um, okay. Yes. Well, I was, I was going to ask you, okay, because obviously the people viewing this, they see young children, which really yep. you are 10, 11, and 12 years old, uh, working on a ship, okay? Right. And so how, how does that happen? How did How is it that your parents allowed you and your sister and your brother to be on the ship at that young age? Uh, explain to people, you know, why that was. Yeah, well, originally my mother went off to the sea project with the promise that us kids, the three of us, my brother, sister, and I could follow. And about six months later, that still hadn't happened. And then she got special permission from the Commodore to have us join because he'd now gotten the Royal Scotman and he had his own family go to the Royal Scotman, but he was still living on the Avon River. But uh, with the Royal Scotman having been purchased, my mom got permission to bring us kids. So that's all arranged and we show up to find when we got there, she wasn't there 
uh, she had sailed off like the day before on the Avon River to do Mission into Time with the Commodore. So um, Mary Sue Hobbit, Commodore's it's, wife, actually sorry, became- explain, them, explain what Mission into Time was. Mission into Time was where uh, the Commodore would have different missionaries, Sea Org members, go out in rowboats, sneak ashore, and uh, survey areas trying to find ruins that he remembered from, from his past lives. And he would draw out maps and tell them where to go. And some people say they didn't find, they didn't find anything. Some people say they did. And I've got one friend who tells me she still has a coin from an old Roman coin that she found during her mission. So there's there's a book on it uh, called Mission Into Time with different people telling stories on what happened. Okay. Now, I didn't mean to interrupt you. You were saying about your mother got sent off on the Mission Into Time and then something about Mary Sue? Yeah. So, yeah, she got sent up. She went off on the mission with the Commodore and everyone else on the Avon River. And uh, so Mary Sue became our legal guardian because we show up and there's no mother there. And our father is in England, shutting everything down in England. So, um, yeah, we were there for the first several weeks without her. I got I mentioned this earlier where I became the dishwasher with my sister. My brother became the pot washer for the galley. And that was what we had to do in order to support living on the ship and not be freeloaders. Right. And then also people should understand anybody who's watching this video for the first time. Janice, you you and your brother and sister were, were basically pretty much raised in Scientology from a very young age. Isn't that right? Yeah, both my sister and I were born into it. And my brother was like three months old when my parents got into Scientology. And they were very dedicated Scientologists in Australia, weren't they? Yes, very dedicated. They had their own Scientology mission. And uh, in 1962, they went to St. Hill and studied on the briefing course uh, directly supervised by L. Ron Hubbard. And uh, yeah, so they had their own franchise within our house. And when the band came out, they were very involved in trying to deal with the band. So yes, they were very active as Scientologists. Okay. And, and I will cover that more in other videos. Okay. All right, here's the next picture here. And this again was um, 1968. On the left is Deanna Ross. Uh, she, I know she watches these videos. Is she in and the then, white shirt? She's in the white shirt? Yes. Right yeah, we're all saluting. We did some sort of song or something. But, um, yeah, so there's Deanna. And then next to her is Annie. That's Annie Tidman, Annie Broker. Annie Rush. <laughs> Annie Rush. Yeah. And it had to be winter because we're wearing uh, winter. We're wearing sweaters. Right. And... The small girl in the middle is Sharon Stainforth. Uh -huh. And uh, Sharon was one of the early messengers with Annie and I. And uh, Claire would have been a messenger at this time, Claire Popham. And so Claire must have been on watch for Annie, Sharon, and I to be together. And that's we're you on always, the right. We're always missing one of the four. Got it. And that's you on the right. And that's me on the right. And behind me is Norman Starkey. That he's got the cap on, right? Yes, he's got the cap on. And next to him is Dave Murphy, who yeah. was a famous chief engineer. I remember then, Dave Murphy. I met Dave Murphy years later at the, the Flag Land Base in Clearwater. Right. Yeah, and then the the lady in the middle, that's Nikki uh, Moen, Mick, Nikki Freeman. And okay. she became Mary Sue's communicator for years. All right. So here's the next picture. All right, this is the Avon River. And the reason I put this in here was to remind myself to tell that there was a point after we were in Corfu for a while that Hubbard wanted to go again and do some another mission into time. So he went over on the Avon and I went as the messenger. Okay. And so Cor Corfu's in Greece, right? Yes, that's one of the Greek islands. So 
I actually got to sail on the Avon River with the Commodore. And in the, fo in the forecastle, the very front of the ship was the woman's dorm, and I slept in a hammock there. <laughs> and um, it, it was a fun trip. Uh, Quinton Hubbard got to go. Arthur Hubbard got to go. Myself, my mother was on it. My brother was on it. So, you know, I was with people I wanted to be with. And I did enjoy that trip. And we'd go swimming over the side in the middle of nowhere off the Greek islands. And I did not do any of the boat missions. They would actually lower a dinghy over the side and motor off to go ashore and check different things out. Okay. And here's the next picture here. <laughs> all right. This one is of the Royal Scotland. It's a later picture. It's all painted white at this point. But I wanted to show you up there at the very top, you can see someone in what's called the crow's nest. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, as young messengers at 12 years old, um, we used to sit outside the Commodore's office, as I showed you in those chairs, and we'd read books or comic books. And then the Commodore had an idea that we were to learn the Scientology dictionary verbatim. Okay. So between message runs, we had to sit in those chairs and learn the dictionary and a contest was made and the loser of the contest out of the four of us had to spend the night up in the crow's nest and um so is i that, happened to be that something you guys worked out or was that something l ron hubbard worked out as a punishment uh i don't i don't even remember how it came about but i ended up as the loser <laughs> So I ended up spending the night up there. Is it big enough? I mean, you you're, you're, were pretty small then. Was, was it roomy up there for you? No, I, you know, I couldn't lay, stretch my legs out and it was cold. I, I climbed up there with a blanket and my sister came with a pillow. So I climbed back down and got the pillow and climbed back up with the pillow. And um, yeah, I spent the whole night up there and it was cold. But that was my penalty for being the loser and learning the dictionary verbatim. Okay. Now I have to ask you a question. All right. So yeah. uh, doesn't that seem like some form of child abuse if you were like 12 years old? Oh, I mean, <laughs> absolutely. Right. Right. Like I mean, would you have your kids up there doing that? I don't think so. <laughs> no, I would not. I laugh right. about it now, but I remember even when I was 17, I hadn't seen my dad in five years. And he mentioned this, um, he, he mentioned and kind of laughed about it, that he'd heard that I'd had to spend the night in the crow's nest. Mm -hmm. And I actually was very offended with my father for the fact that he knew that this type of punishment went on and he still allowed me to stay there. And right. Because uh, I look at my own kids when they were that age, and I'm like, what were my parents thinking? Right. And then I've got to try and justify it to where, okay, it's kind of like this Catholic church. Someone's proud that they send their child off to the Vatican or wherever, and then and they don't see him for years or a long time, but they're proud of them because of what they have accomplished. Uh-huh. And I believe, and I believe that's where my parents did. They were proud that we were working with the Commodore directly, right? And that's what made it okay, right? And you know, as a dedicated Scientologist, I mean, I wasn't in Scientology at that time, but I know that my dad got it, me involved in Scientology at age fourteen. Um, once you get hooked and you're dedicated to what Scientology and L. Ron Hubbard said that they were trying to do, it became the, the greatest thing that you had. I mean, it was the number one priority in your life. And I'm sure that's how it was for your parents as well. Is that right? Exactly. They were yeah. very proud of us. Right. Okay. So let's go on to the next picture here. Yeah, this is, we used to uh, have musters on the dock, and this is a end of muster. We're all going back to the ship. But right in the very center 
is myself with my hand up to my chin and next to me is Claire. And this is in 1968, no, actually probably 69 in Corfu again. And um, yeah, it's just that's two messengers there and the other two are probably changing watches or one sleeping and one on watch. Okay. Let's be one second here. I'm just switching slides. Okay, so that's that one. So here we go. And what's okay. that? So this one would have been um, probably the Commodore's birthday in 1969. And you can see Mary Sue in the background with her cigarette, putting it in the ashtray. And behind her is Bill Howey. Bill Howey was one of the Commodore's aides. And uh, the little boy clapping is Arthur Hubbard. Who is that? Arthur Hubbard is uh, the Commodore's youngest son. Mm -hmm. And then the young girl to the right, that's my sister, who is also a messenger. So now let me say something. Um, the original messengers was, well, Quinton Hubbard did the first three hours and then I replaced him. Okay. And then I was a messenger and then Larry and Julie and Sharon. And we kind of went through various different messengers and I worked to replace myself. But then parents would leave and kids would come and go. And then they wanted me back on. And so I was a messenger. And I remember I was actually up on deck looking over from the prom deck down to the deck below when Bill Howie showed up on the ship with 60 new recruits from How many? How many? 60. Six zero. Six, six zero. Okay. Six zero. I don't know how he did it, but he ended up with sixty people all arriving at the same time. Right. And uh, in that group was uh, Gene Tidman, with um, four daughters. Her oldest was Janice Tidman, and then Nancy Tidman, and Annie Tidman, and Donna Tidman. And uh, the father, Don Tidman, was to follow. Anyway, so Annie was one of the young girls that showed up and became one of my best friends. And she became a messenger with me. And she was in that earlier picture with Sharon. And then we had Claire, who was a messenger. And uh -huh. Claire and Suzette kind of used to replace each other as messengers. Suzette wanted to be a messenger, then she didn't want to be a messenger. So the two of them kind of replaced each other on and off. Okay. So, and then when Sharon had to leave, they were looking for another messenger. And my sister was like 13, 14 years old in the engine room. So I said, well, why, why not Terry? She's young. And so Terry was gotten to be a messenger. So then it became um, myself, Annie, Claire, and Terry. And then we were the next steady messengers for the next two years it was just the four of us so you were like the original senior messengers right the yeah so friends. everyone just referred to us as the original messengers though we weren't or i was but not everybody it's it just became a thing if we were the original messengers the four of us okay now let me ask you another question okay because of because you were 12 13 years old did you yes. all go to school on the ship too i mean how did you how did you we, get your education yeah, we were supposed to do three hours of schooling a day. Uh -huh. And the subjects we did learn was reading, writing, and arithmetic. And that was it. That no was science, it. Basic, no. Just basic stuff. Just reading, writing, and arithmetic. And, and we were supposed to learn so many numbers of words. And our teacher used to just work on the words. Right. And um, we went through tutors. Uh, we went through a 19-year-old, we went through a 70-year-old, we went through old tutors. You know, it was like no one really wanted to be a tutor. <laughs> but, what, um, did they put up with the kids? <laughs> yeah, they had to put up with us. And I wouldn't have wanted to put up with us either. Yeah. Uh, you know, if we didn't like the tutor, we didn't show up. We'd go hide in the lifeboats or just 
disappear and they couldn't find us. All right, well, let me ask you the next question then. Was Hubbard concerned about your education? Uh, sometimes he showed interest in it. He'd ask us what we're learning, but again, it was reading, writing, arithmetic, and Scientology. That is what we learned. Okay. We didn't learn anything else. No chemistry, no, no sewing, no, you know, whatever people learn, no finances, no nothing except for that. Okay. Here's the next picture. All right. All right. This is myself on, um, the Commodore's little Chris Craft, and that's my sister next to me. And behind us is Wait, what's a Chris Craft? What's a Chris Craft? Chris Craft. This is a small boat, like a motorboat. A small motorboat. Yeah. That uh, he could go take it ashore or go go anywhere he wanted with it, or it was like his lifeboat, rather than the regular lifeboats on the ship. He would. It was. He was assigned to that. And messenger, certain messengers are assigned to that with him. And uh, behind us, you can see bending over, that's Des Popham. He was the Commodore's transport in charge. And that was the other messenger, Claire's father. Uh, her parents were on the ship. Des was transport. And Joyce was the uh, secretary for the LRH communicator. Uh -huh. And Des and Joyce kind of uh, adopted Arthur Hubbard because his parents didn't spend any time with him and myself because I had no parents on the ship. Right. Now, and, I mean, um, you brought up a good subject, okay? How much time did L. Ron Hubbard actually spend with his children? Was he mostly working or did he actually take a lot of time like, a, like you had kids? I mean, did you spend more time with your kids than he did with his? Would that be- Oh, a absolutely. Question? <laughs> you know, he never spent much time with his kids. Um, at one, when he first came to the ship, he, he would have dinner with the aides, his aides that were all there to help him. And uh, he would only see his kids pretty much when it was one of their birthdays or his birthday. And the kids didn't even come up to say, hey, I want to go see my dad. That just didn't happen. Uh-huh. Um, and then later on, years later, one of the stewards for the Commodore was like, he doesn't see his children. And then they made a change and they actually set it up where every dinner, the children would have dinner with him and Mary Sue. And that worked out pretty good, except for he would work late. The dinner would be cold or it'd be being reheated. And uh -huh. the kids, Mary Sue, will be sitting at the table waiting for him. And meanwhile, they're regular crew members, so they have jobs. Right. And so it kind of phased out. And uh, But he did always spend birthdays and Christmas, but very little time with them. How about Mary Sue? Was she... Did she spend more time with the kids than, than Hubbard, or, or was it the same way when she was working? She, she was working a lot. She spent a little more time with them, and they always knew they could go to her. Uh, I remember one time um, Suzette and I were in her cabin, and we she had a little hot plate, and we were um, frying up potatoes in, in hot butter. And uh, I knocked the pan or something, and the hot butter fell and just burnt my leg. And uh, Suzette's response was to run off and get her mother. <laughs> <laughs> so you know so she knew the kids always knew she was there i got it okay here's the next picture okay this is just a group going off on liberty and um i'll, I'll go through the different people from left to right do you know left, when this was or where this was you know um i was trying to think of that it might have been lisbon Okay. I'm not or, or I'm not sure. Anyway, on the left, that's Maria Starkey. She was the wife of Norman Starkey. She's since passed away. And then next to her in the button-down uh, jacket and skirt is Joyce Popham. That's Claire's mom. Uh, that's the one who had, you know, took me in, adopted me into the family. Uh -huh. Next to Des, who's standing there in the sunglasses. And in, in front of Des is Reva Spence. 
And um, next to her is Claire. Okay. And then behind her is um, Linda Powers. And then um, I don't remember the other guy's name in the sunglasses. And then in front of him is my sister. In front of her is Arthur Hubbard. You can see how little he was. Okay. And that's why Des, as the transportation for the Commodore, took Arthur on because Arthur was his deputy. So Des was Arthur's boss and uh, taught Arthur everything he knows about cars and boats and basically treated him as his own son. Right. And then next to Arthur on the right is Annie, Annie Tidman. And then uh, there's Mitch Spence in the cowboy hat. He was married to Reva, the cute little one on the left. And then uh, Liz Osley. And then uh, next to them is Barry Watson and Delwyn Watson. Well, people knew her as Delwyn Sanderson. Okay. And then on, on the very end is Suzette Hubbard, uh, okay. the Commodore's second youngest child. All right. Here's the next one. All right. So on the left is Tony Dunleavy and then the Commodore. And behind the Commodore is Annie Tidman Broker. Right. I Now, this is a photo I've never seen before of L. Ron Hubbard and uh, also of Annie. Uh, now, you know, for those who've watched or who are familiar with other channels or whatever, Annie, Annie Broker Tidman, she was with L. Ron Hubbard all the way up until the day that he passed away in 1986. So That's she right. spent the most time with him than any pretty, not David Miscavige, okay? Their, their official correct. church biography says David Miscavige spent more time in communication with L. Ron Hubbard than anybody else. And that's not true. That was, this is Annie Broker here. You can see her as a young girl standing right behind L. Ron Hubbard. Right, and, and to add to that, I mean, since Annie's now passed away, of the original four, there is still Claire, who is in Scientology in good standing, my mm -hmm. sister and I. So there's three of us who have spent more time with L. Ron Hubbard than anybody else that's alive. That's right. Right, because you guys spent six hours a day, seven days a week with him uh, for years, years yes. and years. Yeah, Yes. exactly. Okay, well, here's the next one here. Okay, this is just a fun picture taken on the bridge of the Royal Scotsman. There's my sister on the helm and uh, Annie's over on the radar. And then you can see Suzette looking in the window in the back. <laughs> and what are you all doing there? Well, they, they I just was doing it for a photo. I, I'm not in there because I was obviously with the Commodore at the time. That's why you catch three messengers together with one always missing. Got it. So you guys weren't doing any, they weren't doing any training or anything like that. No, not at that time the photo was taken, but we all did train on the different stuff on the bridge so that we all understood it because we ran a lot of messages to the bridge at sea and so we had to learn how to read a compass, how to steer the ship, how to read the radar, how to read a chart. You know, uh -huh. we had to learn all that. So we knew what we were talking about. I got it. Now, one of the things that uh, I was going to ask you about is I remember because, you know, I did messenger training years later is um, you kids as, as commoners messengers, you guys were emissaries for L. Ron Hubbard. Can you explain to, to people what that meant? Yeah, basically it meant that we were representing Hubbard and what is said to us is basically said to Hubbard. And okay. that if we went on a message run, they had to treat us as if they were talking back to the Commodore and not treat us like kids. Right. So basically if somebody, you know, lipped off to you or whatever, the idea was they, they should know they basically are lipping off to L. Ron Hubbard. Isn't that right? Exactly. And they should know that if they lipped off to us, we're going to go back and repeat it to him. We're not going to add our own thing to it. We relay the message as given to us. Right. Right. Exactly. I mean, as we got older, we changed our ways because you learned what triggered, what triggered Hubbard and what didn't. And, so we'd learn to get the person to not lip off to us and tell them to change the message, you know, just to keep them out of trouble. Right. Also, it kept you guys, you didn't have to deal with 
L. Ron Hubbard's wrath, right? In other words, he may not, he may get upset, but not at you. But you don't, you didn't want to have him upset anyway, right? Exactly. And and plus, we as we got older, we learned to ask more questions, so that when we went back and gave a reply, if if the Commodore wanted to ask more questions, hopefully we already had asked those questions and could fill him in on the information. And yeah, that would and save us having to run all the way back down the decks and then run all the way back up. Yeah, and I, I learned a similar thing. Like when I worked for David Miscavige for the last six years, I was in the C organization. If he if he had a question, you went you would go find the answer but you better find out everything about it because if he has any questions, he's going to get upset if you don't know the answer to the questions that he asks. So you, you have to get complete information and complete details. Otherwise you're running around all day. Exactly. Okay. So let me go to the next one here. Bear with me, people. I'm uh, pulling these slides up as we go along here. All right. So who's this here? Okay. That is myself and my sister. And this was in 1969 in Casablanca, Morocco. Um, the ship was in dry dock. And uh, while the Commodore and Mary Sue were staying at a hotel in Casablanca while the ship was in dry dock, to keep us busy, we helped out the quartermasters. And so people coming aboard would always, you know, the quartermaster was there to log them coming aboard or leaving the ship or the quartermaster would go off and do inspections of the ship lines and that type of thing. Uh -huh. And uh, so we were assigned to help them out to keep us busy. We were also put on um, some training because at this time, the Commodore wanted to set, set up a advanced organization, St. Hill, on the east coast of the U.S., and his plan was to have my mother as the commanding officer. She was in LA as the commanding officer of AOLA at the time. It was AOLA. And, uh, Advanced Organization Los Angeles. Okay. That's Yeah, that's where the higher level Scientology services were delivered. Okay. So she was there as the commanding officer and the plan was to set up on the East Coast and have her there and reunite our family, have my sister and I and my brother go there and anybody else with kids on the ship would all go to the East Coast. But by the time he came back from staying at the hotel um, and coming back aboard, shortly after that, plans changed. We weren't going to do the East Coast anymore. And my mother ended up coming up with the idea of a booking center for celebrities. Uh -huh. And so she ended up remaining in Los Angeles and setting up a booking center, which then turned into Celebrity Center. And this which was in- still, still exists today. Which still exists today in the uh, Five Field Manor uh, in Hollywood. Got it. So, but, so the plan for us to reunite with our mother went to the wayside and we ended up staying on the ship another, what well, I was on the ship nearly eight years um, from- I bet, it, I bet it was frustrating as a young young uh, teenager uh, to be separated that long from your parents. Yeah, well, I went from 12 years old to 17 without ever seeing my dad in those five years. Wow. And my mother came to the ship maybe three times during those five years. And that's when she said, you know what, I'm going to ask your dad to come up with the money to have you girls and my brother come and visit on our three-week leave. Because we'd been there from 68 to 73 and never taken a leave, never left the ship. Or we had left the ship, but we were still Sea Org and no leave of absence. Right. So in 73, she arranged that and we finally got to take three weeks off and go visit her and our dad. I got it. All right, here's the next picture here. Yeah, so this would have been probably my 14th, 13th, 14th, 13th, 14th birthday. Uh -huh. But in this picture, the girl looking at the camera seated is my sister, Terry. Uh -huh. And then uh, behind her is Arthur Hubbard. And then uh, Quentin Hubbard, the other son of uh, the Commodore, is 
is next to Arthur. Mm -hmm. And then across the table is my brother, who obviously came up to uh, have dinner with us to celebrate my birthday. Right. And uh, that's me. They hung my gift um, from the sprinkler. The sprinkler, sorry. Yeah, they hung my gift from the sprinkler, so I had to reach up to get it. And then uh, the person who's back to the camera is Suzette Hubbard. So it was pretty much the Gillums and the Hubbards. We all, we kind of hung together. We did that at St. Hill and we did that on the ship. Got it. Okay. And then here's the next picture here. Yep. That's the cover of my first book. That's on the A deck quarter deck of the Royal Scotman. And you can see uh, the, there's a lot of red lead there, but paint, you know, to cover up the rust. Uh -huh. uh, they've been chipping rust and uh, trying to clean the ship up. And so there's red lead there that's supposed to be painted over later on. But uh, we're outside the ADEC lounge, which was the Commodore's lounge and also his dining room. Okay. Yeah, but we're we're heading to go down below decks. Okay. All right. And then the next picture here. Yeah, this is, um, so obviously my sister Terry was on watch with the Commodore because uh -huh. this, because Annie on the right, Claire on the left, and myself in the middle went into uh, Lisbon and uh, went into a little photo booth and took this photo. That's a cute photo. Uh, how old <laughs> do you think you all were there? Uh, probably 14. Right. Yeah. And then you said Annie yeah. Ann passed away several years ago, right, from cancer. Is that right? Yes, yes. Yeah, and, and Claire's still but, alive, but she's in, still in Scientology. Yes. Now, Claire's parents, as I pointed out, were on the ship. Yeah. Annie's parents were on the ship, but her parents left in 72 when Annie would have been 16. They left because um, the mom got pregnant. And so she was moved ashore in Tangier, where we had a base, and uh, had her child, Jackie Sue, and then when that was closed down, they were moved to Denmark to raise the child there. So I don't believe Annie saw her parents again. I know she had them when, when the Commodore passed away, and he had them transferred to Clearwater so she could see them. But uh -huh. I don't know that she ever actually did see them again. Right. That's a yeah. sad story. All right, here's the next picture here. And that is me on the um, Portside Bridge wing Re replying uh, to the Commodore on a message. And uh, I'm telling him my, I'm telling him the message answer and he's listening to what I have to say. Got it. All right, and then we have this one. This is the last picture here. I've never seen this picture before. I think it's a great photograph. Why don't you explain who that, who, who are those people there? Yeah, well, again, my sister must be on watch because she's missing. But um, the front person is Annie, who's leaning back and whose legs up in the air. And then I'm, behind, I'm next to her, hanging on to uh, the post. Yeah. And behind me is Suzette Hubbard. And then Claire Popham is at the end. And that's, we were, Suzette, that's Suzette is the third one? I thought that was Terry. No, that's Suzette. Oh, yeah. okay. And I remember we were sailing out of Lisbon at that time. And we were called... You know, we'd all gotten promoted from, uh, we had no rank or we were cadets, but we all got promoted to the rank of midshipmen. And so people used to call us the middies uh -huh. because there was five of us where only four were messengers. And then there was, a, I think, a couple of the people who became midshipmen that we hung out with. And so, yeah, it became the middies. All oh, the middies did this, the middies did that. And um, we get in trouble as a group, as the middies. But um, yeah, we were mostly messengers, but all the middies. So you you were close friends and and did a lot of a lot of you goofed off together, did a lot of things together. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. And you know we we got liberty every two weeks, and so Claire and I were on the same watch together. That we would go on liberty with her parents and Arthur. 
And um, Annie and Terry were on the opposite watch and they would go off with other people on Liberty. Because being underage, we had to have escorts over 21 years old to go ashore. And um, so that's why I went with the Poppins because otherwise I'd be stuck on the ship and nowhere to go. And they right. took me in and they were wonderful substitute parents. Right. Okay, so I need to ask you a couple questions that I'm sure our viewers are may be thinking, okay? There okay. are rumors that L. Ron Hubbard had this bevy of young women, young girls, as his harem, uh, taking care of him and that type of thing. Uh, did anything like that happen? Was there any kind of sexual harassment or anything like that that occurred while you were a teenager uh, working as a messenger for L. Ron Hubbard? Not with me. There was nothing sexual about it. It was strictly duty. Um, yeah, there, there was no no sexual stuff okay. between Hubbard and I or, you know, other messengers. I know one messenger has said that he tried to kiss her when she was 16, but um, everybody else says it didn't happen to them. Okay, but, but he was friendly and he treated you all well, is that right? Yeah, he was friendly. He treated us well. As we became more more longevity with him, he would refer to all of us as one, you know, it's cause us, you know, as right. in rather than just him, it now included the messengers. Right. Because we, you know, and he he was like a father to to many of us. Uh -huh. He had that fatherly figure to us. Um, there was one time where I was, I was putting on some weight or my face was breaking out, you know, so it was like, okay, if anyone caught me eating toast, <laughs> I had to pay a dollar. <laughs> um, he also gave gifts, right? He was very generous as far as birthdays and Christmas and everything. right? Yes. Yes. Yeah, usually I'd get a necklace or earrings or something like that for Christmas or for my birthday from him. Okay. And yeah, but, but he he wasn't giving those gifts to groom you, like they say, where they're you're, they're grooming young women. Oh by, no, you know, laying out no. all these fancy gifts or anything like that. They were actually no. just like you said you treated him like a father figure, right? It was like a, a gift that any anyone would give, right? Correct, like and um, you know. He was very down on any guys hitting on the messengers. We were jailbait. Uh -huh. And the guys on the ship knew that, not to mess with us. Right. Um, one guy on the ship messed with it. He, he slept with a 17-year-old. And when Hubbard found out about it, he actually had a messenger go get that guy. And he took a good swing at him. He was so furious that um, a minor was being messed with. And right. there was another time um, where another guy was found out to have slept with a minor. And Mary Sue actually went down to her cabin, put on her officer hat, strapped on a knife, went down and found this guy, <laughs> made him kneel and held the knife to his throat. Uh -huh. and told him to get off the ship under no uncertain terms. He was to be right. off. And he was he was beached. He right. had no money, no nothing. All he had was a open ticket back to the U.S. Mm -hmm. And nobody cared. He was just dumped ashore in Morocco and had to find his own way back. And that was his punishment for having slept with someone that was under 18 years old. Got it. Got it. Okay, well, that, that's the end of this first part of uh, your story about the Commodore's Messenger. Is that right? Yes, that is. And the next one I will do is I'll cover when we added three more messengers, and that will take us from 71 up to 72, 73. <laughs> Got it. And then we also, we'd, we'd like to ask you to please subscribe to our channel if you haven't already. <clears throat> About half the people watching our videos are not subscribed. So please just click that subscribe button and you'll get notifications of our next show. That's my dog barking. Please ignore her. <laughs> anyway, and if you like this episode, please click the like button, okay? The other thing, I, hold on, I'm going to shut the door.
I'm sorry. Okay. The other thing is, if you have any questions about anything that we've covered or any comments, please write them in the comments. I know that Janice and I, we both go through all of the comments and we answer any questions that we can. So we really appreciate any uh, of your input. And we'll be doing live streams shortly where you can actually ask us questions live. Okay. And then lastly, like I said before, uh, Janice's book, I want to take this down. Commodore's Messenger, okay? It's available on Amazon.com, book one and book two. So we really appreciate it. If you're interested in more detail on these stories and many more, please buy her book. There's a link uh, on the description page of our, of our channel, and uh, we think you'll enjoy it. Janice, do you have anything else that you wanted to mention? No, I am appreciating the comments, and um, I do try to answer them. So uh, please keep writing. If you've got questions, we'll see what we can do to answer. Thank you. That's right. Well, anyway, thank you for watching, everybody. We want to say, uh, hope you have a great day, and we'll see you on the next video. Okay. Bye. Bye.